Good morning and uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Cooper, for that generous introduction. At the end of the very moving session with music we just heard, I was touched by the remembrance of uh, Sashka Rao de Haas about her first performance on the cello with her guru, where she sat on the chair and the guru sat on the floor. And that brought to mind an inevitable parallel with Mahatma Gandhi. Because he led India, he led more than India, but he always put the people he led on the chair while he sat on the floor. And that is a metaphor which really animates the book that Gopalji has authored, a recreation, if you will, of the early career, hopes, struggles of the then Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, recreated entirely through his own letters, his talks, his interviews, and brought into dramatic first person. But before we get to the book itself, I should like to ask Gopalji to give us an impression of success, as it were, of the man, the Mahatma, and your estimate of him at this distance in time. Sir. Thank you very much, Ramu, if I may call you by your first name. I'm grateful for your reference to the music journey that we have just been part of and to the remarkable description given of the student being on a chair and the guru being on the floor. For this book, which we are talking about, is a compilation of Mohandas Gandhi's descriptions of his early life when he was a student. Descriptions which are not part of his autobiography, but which occur in different observations of his, his writings and speeches, which supplement his autobiography. His pupilship, his being a student, took him to London and then to South Africa. And South Africa features very prominently in this book. He was to say much later in his life, in fact, a few months before he died, he was to say that he was born in India but made in South Africa. And he's, in a sense, a freshly anointed barrister sat on a chair. I'm borrowing and reborrowing Saskia's brilliant description. He sat on a chair, a high barrister, when he went to Durban in South Africa to commence his practice. But he was very soon brought down to ground level by his experiences there, which really made him what he was to become, called by many Mahatma. There were many sides to him which fascinate his observers, his students, which fascinate history. There are many sides of him which have made people adore him, almost worship him. Something which he flinched from. He did not like adulation. Certainly nothing like worship. And he distanced himself from the description of Mahatma. But of one thing, those who do not agree with him, and who have many issues to take up with him, will also agree with. That is, 
he was a profoundly unusual, almost incredible man, never boring. For one thing, he loved to laugh at himself. He loved to laugh, but he loved to laugh at himself and at his own foibles. But for another more important thing, two things stood out about him. He was unafraid. From the very start, the seeds of his greatness were there in him from the very start, though nurtured in South Africa particularly. There were three things he was particularly unafraid of. One was disgrace. Disgrace by those who opposed him in the eyes of the world. Another, defeat. For he did not think victory was a great goal. He wanted the approbation of his conscience more than anything else. The approval of his inner voice more than anything else. So he was not afraid of defeat. And he was not afraid of death. These are the three things which stand out about him. His courage, which is almost a cliche to say a man is a man of courage. But he was that, completely unafraid. That's my response to what you suggested. I could start with Ramu. Uh, thank you so much, Kopalji. I'd like to seize that phrase, the absence of fear, the refusal to be afraid. And it's an echo which I found very stirring in this book. Is there an excerpt you could share with us on that theme or beyond? Whenever in a book launch, the author turns the pages of his book to read from, and I'm in the audience, my heart sinks. <laughs> How many pages is he going to read from? Not too many, I assure you. In fact, very few. And very few portions from very few pages. <laughs> we are in a city where the unexpected has happened in very many frightening ways. Frightening not just to the persons concerned, but frightening to humanity. We are in such a city. But New York is representative of the whole world and of the whole world over time, where the unexpected, the unpleasant happen all the time. But the counter, the antidote to the unexpected also happens. So it's not as if violence, for instance, is destined to rule. There is a counter to it. And this man belongs to the tradition of the counter to that. There was an episode which I will not linger too much on about the registration of persons of Indian origin in South Africa. A compulsory registration by fingerprinting. And Gandhi who was in already a position of leadership among the Indians in South Africa said fingerprinting is for criminals in India. In India we do fingerprinting only of criminals. We are not going to give our fingerprints. But then he was jailed for what he had said. But when a proposal came to him from the authorities, then General Smuts, who was in charge of the Ministry of Interior, for a compromise, Gandhi said, what is the compromise? Smuts said, If we remove the compulsion for fingerprinting, we make it voluntary, would you agree? And Gandhi thought about it and said, what was my objection to fingerprinting? Was it the act of fingerprinting or was it the rule that brought in the act? So he said it was really the, the violence of the rule which said, you shall give your fingerprints. 
I have no objection as such to fingerprinting, which is like another form of signing. So if it is not made compulsory, if it's made voluntary, I don't mind, as long as we get our rights. But the Indian community got divided. The Indian community getting divided is not a new phenomenon. It got divided. It said, you told us to object to fingerprinting, now you are saying it's voluntary, so you can go and give your fingerprints? Gandhi said, yes. Yes, I did. And I'm now saying if it is voluntary, it's all right, because there's no compulsion. We're not going to be fined or jailed if we don't give our fingerprints. But if we give our fingerprints, we will get certain rights. I think that's all right. So he suddenly made a lot of enemies among the Indian community in South Africa. And this is what happened. A large meeting was called on 2nd February 1909 of Indians and sympathizers at the Masonic Lodge in Johannesburg. The gathering overflowed the confines of the hall, crowding up the doorway. After the meeting was over, I came down from the platform and walked out of the hall together with Millie, Henry Pollack's wife, the wife of his associate, Henry Pollack. As we reached the outer door, Millie and I noticed a man standing in the shadow of it. I walked up to him directly and linked my arms with him. As we spoke in a low voice, Millie could not hear us and in any case could not have followed us for we were talking in a language she did not understand. After I had finished, the man hesitated for a moment, turned and walked away. And Millie observed all this from the other side of me, and then she and I stepped onto the street. At the end of the street, the man came back and handed me a knife which he had been carrying. The following conversation then assumed between Millie and me. Millie. What did the man want? Anything special? Yes. He wanted to kill me. To kill you? To kill you? How horrible! Is he mad? No, no. He thinks I am acting traitorously towards our people, that I am intriguing with the government against them, and yet pretending to be their friend and leader. But that is all wicked and dreadful. Such a man is not safe. He ought to be arrested. Why did you let him go like that? He must be mad. No, he is not mad. Only mistaken. And you saw that after I talked to him, he handed over to me the knife he had intended to use on me. But he would have stabbed you in the dark. I... Do not disturb yourself too much about it. He thought he wanted to kill me, but he really had not the courage to do so. If he were as bad as he thought, if I was as bad as he thought I was, I should deserve to die. Now we will not worry about it anymore. It is finished. I do not think that man will attempt to injure me again. Had I had him arrested, I should have made an enemy of him. As it is, he will now be my friend. But that is not all. A little later, when Gandhi was going to actually give his fingerprints, this is what happened. Mr. Yusuf Mia and others had arrived at 10.30 before we set out to the Asiatic office, which is where the fingerprinting was to be done. Mir Alam and his companions followed us, and I did feel there would be an attack on me. Not more than three minutes' walk from the registration office, I became surer. Mir Alam accosted me and asked, Where are you going? He must have asked this in Hindustani. Where I propose to take out a certificate of registration giving the ten fingerprints. 
If you will go with me, I will first get you a certificate with an impression of only two thumbs. But I will then take one for myself, giving the fingerprints. I had scarcely finished the last sentence when a heavy cudgel blow descended on my head from behind. I do not remember the manner of the assault, but people say that I fell down unconscious with the first blow which was delivered with a stick and they also kicked me. Thinking me dead, they stopped. I have an impression that as the blows started, I uttered the words, He Rama. I have no notion what followed. I have no notion what followed. I have an impression that as the blows started, I uttered the words, He Rama. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. It's, it's evocative also of the continuous thread in history, and you've written separately about a much later period in Gandhiji's life after India's independence, where he went out to a mob in Calcutta and said, kill me, kill me, mm. because I will not leave you in peace mm. if you do not. So that idea, and if I may also go to the punctuation mark of today's date, the last September 14th in Gandhiji's life, September the 14th, 1947, in his diary he says, during the night as I heard what should have been the soothing sound of gentle rain, my mind went out of the thousand of refugees lying around in the camps in Delhi. Mm. And thinking of refugees and migrants, I'd like for a moment to move away from Mahatma Gandhi to Gopal Gandhi. And your sense and your experience with immigrants and refugees and mm. the three major landscapes in which you've worked, your first book titled Refuge was on a Tamil labor in Sri Lanka where you also served as India's High Commissioner. Then your work in South Africa, again as High Commissioner, and within India and West Bengal as Governor. What do you see in the sense of both despair and hope, which in a sense Gandhiji helped to bring succor to, while at the same time never, never allowing himself to feel satisfied or complacent about the situation? Thank you for that very thoughtful question. The word minority is uh, widely used, but widely used simplistically. In India, it is most widely used in the sense of religious minorities. In other parts of the world, including the United States, ethnic minorities. But from South Africa onwards, Gandhi identified himself with the persons who are vulnerable. Vulnerability was for him the distinguishing mark of the person who needs help. And this vulnerability transcended all conditions. They were not just political conditions, but human conditions. So those who were from a religious background which was in numerically small numbers, to a political background, again, in a weak number, and to persons who were just not as strong as the other person, which could include women as such, Communities like those that he called Harijan, and now more appropriately called Dalit, people who believed in different lifestyles, who were just different, including very specially those with physical handicaps. So Gandhi instinctively identified himself with these. So those who were 
migrants, immigrants in South Africa, mainly Tamil and Telugu, and those who were vulnerable in East Bengal, who were Hindu, in West Bengal, who were Muslim, in Delhi, who were Muslim, in Lahore, who were Hindu, and those whom the whom society across all religions shrank from because they suffered from di- diseases like leprosy. All of them instinctively got Gandhi's embrace. That's the only way I can put it. And this axiomatically made him unpopular with the larger group, made him a figure of contrariness, whom they should dissociate from and who they should not support because that would reduce their own hold in their largeness. Something that Gandhi did not care about, he did not worry about. In fact, he almost celebrated. So his taking to what Ramu referred to as stay in Bengal, which links by a set of circumstances to my own very small association with Bengal much later, symbolized by his fascination for a song which the great musicians who have played before us today would identify, song by Rabindranath Tagore called Akla Cholore, Walk Alone, Walk You Alone, which is what he did in South Africa when he was experiencing the pain of the Tamil and Telugu and some Bihari migrant laborers, which he did in India, and which he did very, very, particularly in Bengal, in the months leading to the partition of India, which was the other side of the freedom of India, of the independence of India, walking alone. Akla Chalore, which is the way he was found by the person who ended his life on the 30th of January, 1948. He was not literally alone because he had with him his grandnieces, but he was conceptually alone. The government of India had come into Indian hands, but he was not of the government. He was on his own. He was apart from the government. He was part of the struggle which had led to the freedom of India and the formation of the government, but he was apart from the government. He was apart from the majority community in Delhi. And he was going to and wanting to go to Lahore to be apart from the majority community there, which was Muslim. To be alone, to strengthen the weak, the vulnerable, to be what the great hymn, Abide With Me, calls the help of the helpless. Thank you for that reference to the weak and the vulnerable. It actually brought to mind a thought that occurred to me at our event last evening with uh, Mrs. Tara Gandhi and the title, Bird Speak. It's not that people are voiceless, it's that they are not heard. And I think that is the lesson, as with birds. And that is the lesson that Gandhiji taught us. But I'd like to take you up on your point about the human rather than the political connections. Another anniversary today, 14th of September, is that much later of the Roundtable Conference in London in 1931, which began on a non-propitious note because it began on a Monday, the day that Gandhiji had a vow of silence. So he sat the whole day without speaking at all. And um, actually, there's a delicious misprint of the New York Times the next day, which says that all of Gandhiji's internal opponents were there, 
including the Maharaja Baroda Gekwad, who was representing the Princess of India, Princess spelled P-R-I-N-C-E-S-S. <laughs> but uh, be that as it may, there was a remark that Gandhiji made, made there saying that we want a connection between two absolute peoples, mm. not between two political entities, to go back to your human and political connections. And here I wanted to reflect, if I may, on a remark that you made just last month at the Indian Institute of uh, Management in Bangalore, where you said the most important change in India is not material, but attitudinal and intellectual. Mm -hmm. And I think that is an aspect of Gandhiji we sometimes forget or obscure because he did so much that was tactile and material. And the one factor I would like your reflections on is his absolutely unsqueamish, uncoy references to love. Mm. And he thought of the Indian relationship with Britain, uh, and he actually had the phrase, in India held not by force, but the silken cord of love. Mm -hmm. And the very last paragraph in this wonderful book says, the creeper of love I have planted and watered with tears. I can utter this from my own experience, and rich has been the harvest I have reaped. Oh, yeah. So where do we stand in 2022 with the idea of love and all its attendance, be it responsibility, care, hope, what can we learn from and be inspired by? Thank you for uh, enlarging the field of discussion. The reference to that line of verse is to a line in, in one of Mirabai's compositions, attributed to Mirabai. Asuvana jala sincha sincha prema bela boi. I've watered this creeper of love with my tears. He wrote this from aboard the ship as he was leaving South Africa, having concluded his struggle uh, to, and brought it to a reasonable success. So what would he have been doing today. For one thing, he would have been 153. But spiritually, assuming he is there, which I do believe uh, everyone is in some, some very essential way, everyone who is anyone, outlasts the corporeal life in an essential way, at least to those who love that, those persons. What would he have been doing today? What would love mean to him today? I believe three things, essentially. We don't realize something which he knew to be true, which is that completely immersed as we are in the quotidian world of our existence, of our daily engagements, our commitments are being embroiled in the workaday life, we do not realize that as a people inhabiting this planet, we are on the brink of terrible disaster. that there are weapons of mass destruction in stockpiles across the world, across the world, weapons of mass destruction, which can get invoked by error, by design, or by terror at any time, is a stark reality. And if those who have made these weapons suffer by their manufacture, that would be one thing. That would be sad, but that would be one thing. The tragedy is that millions of innocents 
amongst whom we may count ourselves, will also vanish. Now this is something which he was aware because he had spoken on this in different ways. He would today, I think, have been along with Bertrand Russell and Albert Einstein who started his famous campaign in 1955 for the elimination, gradual, perhaps, calibrated, certainly, of the world's stocks, stockpiles of mass destructive weapons. He would have been with them, leading in his own very unique way, very unique way, a campaign for disarmament. I think that would have been essential for him. And this would have brought him in conflict with almost every major power. But more importantly, I think it would have brought him in conflict with political opinion across the world among people. If we were to take a, a, an opinion poll among people, do you want weapons in your country, nuclear weapons in your country, to be dismantled? I am not sure that everybody would say yes. If many would, but I think many more may not. And he would be very appreciative of Nelson Mandela's government, which dismantled its nuclear weapon scheme, including arrangements immediately after coming into office. So there is an example in the world of a country that has actually reversed its policy and programs and projects on ground of weaponization. So he would have been doing that. The second is, and I'm not going to discuss this very long, but climate change, all of us know about it. So much in the United States, so much part of the United States, towards the West, California, Colorado, is without water. Four districts in India today have suffered on account of the monsoon failure and rice production has collapsed. Bangalore City, which is the pride of our IT, has been swimming in water, climate change. He would have been talking about the importance of closing down the arsenals of global warming to all countries, including the third world. And the third is human rights. Human rights do not need any explanation. For him, human rights was just the word that Ramu highlighted. Love, love of life. Without his own personal clinging to living, but love of the right to life. Thank you so much for that, sir. I think this is a wonderful point to, to end this phase of our conversation, this love of and exaltation in life, which might seem so unreal or surreal for someone who many regard as an ascetic, but who actually, as you mentioned earlier, was full of good cheer, fun, and joy. Maybe at this point we could enlarge the con conversation to the larger audience, which is completely invisible at this point to Mr. Gandhi and me, but I'm sure we will all be lit up very soon. It is not compulsory to ask questions. <laughs> and comments are equally welcome. <laughs> but I must also say that this arrangement by which those on a stage have the limelight and the large number of people who are not on stage are in darkness is something he would not have been happy about. I can't see all of you, but I can probably hear all of you, especially if Ramo repeats the questions to <laughs> no, me. No, I believe we are putting on the auditorium lights, are we? Or, oh, they're on? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, right. Okay, then maybe um, I, even if I can't see anyone, should anyone have a point to uh, or uh, Ms. And we Cooper, have a mic here yeah, for please. everyone. Anyone yeah. who has a question, just please come up and. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. And join the light. <laughs> yeah. That would be excellent. Yeah. But if there's no question, Right, I mean, is no one there yet? No. Okay, then I'll just, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, please do, thank you. Please go ahead, thanks. And uh, do tell us who you are, if you can.
Hi, uh, my name is Asha Jadeja, and uh, I had a question for uh, for Gopal Ji about Gopal. How old were you, and what's your memory of sort of play with Gandhi? And you know, were you would you be with your grandfather? Would you be you know with him in more? I mean, I'm just trying to think of my own own granddaughter right now, with what she's always on my lap, or you know. And I, could you tell us a little bit more about your personal? You know, uh, how old were you when you were with uh, your grandfather and, you know, the state of play, conversations, or storytelling or something? Now, you have to repeat the question to me. Thank you. Uh, she was asking for a personal reminiscence of what it was like to be Gandhiji's grandson. How was he to you as a grandfather? I was two and a half when he was assassinated, so I have no personal uh, memories of him. I have only been told uh, about certain things that happened when I was around him. Um, so there are no reminiscences of my own to share, uh, to add to what I have already said. But I would like to just say this by way of what he was to his family. Again, to use the word which Ramu invoked, love, he, he loved his family deeply, but there was a constant tussle in his mind between the demands on his time of his public life, his uh, public persona, his duties to the, to the community, to the country, to what he felt he owed to the world and his time for the family. But he managed to bridge those in his own very unique way. One was, this is before the world came into the email universe, the torrent of letters written by him. I use the word very deliberate, torrent, to his children, to his to his son's wives, that is, to his daughters-in-law, to his grandchildren, constant. Giving them love, giving them frank advice, scorching advice, saying things which were quite hurtful sometimes because he disapproved and approved, always ending with this. Now I have said what I wanted to say, but I leave it to you to do what you want to do because you are now independent of me. Do what you like, but this is what I feel. So what do I do? Do I do what I like to do or do I do what Bapu has said? And invariably, we all ended up doing what Bapu had said, except his eldest son, Harilal, who was his own, his own man. He did exactly what he wanted to do, which is very different from what his father wanted to do. And I don't want to exceed the time limit too much, except to say this, that Harilal was a rebellious son, madly devoted to his mother, and he said, if Gandhi, my father, is anything, it's because of my mother, which was not wrong. It was very true, something which Gandhi himself accepted. On the day Gandhi was assassinated, Harilal was in <coughs> Bombay. Four sons Gandhi had. Harilal was the eldest. And observers have said that Harilal was in a tea shop, which I think is a euphemism for another kind of place selling another form of beverages. But when Harilal heard this on the radio, he stood up and said, I will kill the man who has murdered my father, and ran out. It's a very natural reaction, a very natural reaction, from somebody who had rebelled against his father. And I can imagine Gandhi telling Harilal, Harilal, 
once again, his last admonition to his son, Harilal, you are not supposed to kill the man who has murdered your father. You are supposed to befriend the man who has murdered your father. Imagination. But imagination from experience is allowed. Thank you so much, Gopalji, for that uh, rousing concluding note. And as we approach the 75th anniversary of Gandhiji's martyrdom in a few months from now, mm. I think that is the one thought that will remain and will endure. His demonstration of the power of love, as we've agreed, and also what you just mentioned, the power of imagination. He saw what could be possible, might be possible, and yet was unlikely, he brought it within our grasp. He gave us back our pride. Thank you. Thank you, Kupat.